grace, mercy, and peace be from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're continuing our sermon series of the book of Daniel. If you brought your Bible with you, you might want to open to Daniel chapter 5. And in Daniel chapter 5, we run across a very common saying, the writing is on the wall. And there are common sayings that many of you guys do not know where they came from. For example, uh, butter somebody up. Where did butter somebody up came from? Well, it came from a practice in uh, other nations where there are gods and goddesses that people pray to. And to make the god or goddess listen to you, you would take pieces of butter and throw them on top of the god. And as you throw the butter on the god, you are buttering up the god so it would hear your prayer. So that's where that idea came from. How about don't put the baby out with the bathwater? Uh, that came from uh, about 100 years ago. If you were living, you would take a bath maybe once a week. And guess who would take the bath first? Would be the dad. He'd take the bath, and then all the boys would take the bath, and then the wife would take the bath, and then the girls would take the bath. And by the time you got to the baby taking the bath, the bath water would be so dark and so grungy that it would be easy to lose that baby in the bath water and throw it out with the dirty water. Okay, who's ever heard of the phrase, the whole nine yards? Okay, whole nine yards comes from World War II. Uh, the bomber pilots, uh, they have a machine gun, and guess how long uh, the bullets were that held the thing? It was nine yards long. And so to shoot the whole nine yards, you would shoot all your bullets in that one string. And now we get to the idea of the writings on the wall. And as you see in the sermon, on both sides, the writing is on the wall. And we're going to see what this writing means, where this phrase came from. So if you can, take out your sermon notes for today. Keep your Bibles open. And let's get into Daniel chapter 5. And Daniel chapter 5 starts out with this king, Belshazzar. And he's given this great banquet for his nobles. And they are drinking up a storm. And they are getting kind of tipsy. And the king orders that the gold and silver goblets that his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar stole from the temple of Jerusalem be brought out for the feast. And as the golden tablets of uh, goblets are brought out, they begin to feast to the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron and wood. And this story is taking place 30 years after last week's story. In last week's story, King Nebuchadnezzar is humble and proclaims the God of Israel is the true God. Now his grandson is on the throne, and things aren't going as well. Under Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian Empire was getting bigger and bigger. Now it's getting smaller and smaller. And in fact, a few weeks before this, the army of Babylon had been defeated by the Medes and the Persians. And they have now retreated back into the capital city of Babylon. And all around Babylon, on the walls, the Babylonian soldiers look at their fires. The Medes and the Persians have surrounded the city of Babylon. And in the midst of this siege, the king is throwing a big, big party. And how do we know that this stuff really took place? How do we know that there was a king, Belshazzar? Well, if you look up here, this is how the Babylonians writing looked. And this is their books, you might say. And this particular uh, Babylonian writing has, guess whose name on it? Yep, King Belshazzar is on this tablet. I can't point out exactly where it is because my uh, ancient Babylonian is kind of rusty. But this stuff really did happen years uh, from Babylon. And as this king is mocking God, talking about the gods of gold and silver, something bad is going to happen. Because he is using the instruments of worship to make fun of God. If you look in your sermon notes under uh, 1B, there's a quote. The temple at Jerusalem was the place where the true God had established his earthly dwelling. Here God spoke to the people through his word. Here he met people with his mercy. Here people approached him with their confession of sin and with their plea for forgiveness. And it is there that people found the mercy seat where God's forgiveness was. And yet this king is mocking God. And do we live in an age where people make fun of God? Ah, uh, yeah. People make fun of you guys as Christians. 
Do they make fun of Jesus? Yeah. This is the age we live on. And you've got to expect that people are going to think that you're crazy for following a God who would come and live among us and die for us. And because they have rejected the real God, they have made false gods that they worship. Uh, Martin Luther said this, the human heart is an idol factory. And what kind of idol do we worship here in our culture? It is the idol of more. And this idol is in all of your hearts. If you just had a little bit more, then you would be happy. If I just had a bigger house, then I'd be happy. If I just had a better car, then I'd be happy. We are inflicted with the idol of more. And uh, there's a good book, if you like reading good books, called When the Game is Over, It All Goes Back in the Box. And the author said this, Yale theologian Pollock said that there are two kinds of richness in life. Richness of having and richness of being. Get this in? So there's riches of having, riches of being. Riches of having is external circumstances. Riches of being is an inner experience. We usually focus on the riches of having. We think that true happiness lies there. We seek riches of having, but what we really want is richness of being. We want to be grateful, joyful, content, free from anxiety and generous. We scramble after riches of having because we think we'll produce riches of being, but it does not. So where do you learn the richness of being? It is here in worship. You learn that life is about loving God and loving the people around you. That that is where joy is found. And so in our preschools, we teach the riches of being. We teach those kids the stories of the Bible, like the story of the Good Samaritan. To stop and help those in need. That is being rich. To pray and worship God. That is being rich. And this God is not doing that. He thinks the riches of having is what it's about. And so look what happens next. And read with me part number two. Ready? Suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand to the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. The king summoned the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. And he said to those wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads the writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck. He will be made a little highest ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. So Belshazzar became even more terrified and his face grew pale, and his nobles were baffled. And so here's kind of a one person's picture of what was happening, the writing on the wall. And archaeologists have found the room where this took place in. Uh, they found the very room. It's about 88 feet wide and 168 feet long. And this room, they've only discovered the bottom of it, was all white plaster all around the room. So into this white plaster comes this hand, and this hand writes a message to the king of Babylon. You might say the final message from God, that his time was up. You see, this guy had forgotten about the ruler of the universe. He had mocked God, and judgment was about to come upon him. And what was going to happen was this. You remember the Medes and the Persians all around the walls? Well, running through the middle of Babylon was a great big river. And what the Medes and the Persians thought, we can't go through the wall or over the wall or around the wall, but we can go under the wall where the river is. And so guess what the Medes and Persians did with that river above Babylon? They built a dam. And once they built the dam, the water went around Babylon. And where the river went through Babylon, their troops marched on the riverbed under the wall and sacked Babylon. But that comes in a few minutes. So the writing is on the wall for this king. And he does not understand.